few weeks ago, uh, I uh, was watching our uh, Socialist Brother podcast, This Is Revolution, and there was this call that I found uh, really interesting. Hey, uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, actually, something a bit off the topic. Um, going back to kind of what the video for, or the interview from uh, with Chris Catron last week and a bit of what we touched on earlier um, during the discussion. I guess an issue that comes to mind is we have a pretty long history of leftist revolutionary activism. Most of it is failed, but where it succeeded, we also have a lot of regimes that turned into something other than what we were hoping for. How do we reckon with that potential without simply turning you know, without giving up, you know? I actually thought it might be worth, a, you know, an episode of its own, or at least an episode where we could spend a good 45 minutes talking about it, because I think this is a really important question that doesn't get, uh, that uh, probably, probably does not get as much play as it should, uh, because both sort of in principle and because, uh, and also because, you know, if you're serious about, you know, convincing people, to believe in a horizon that goes past capitalism, uh, this is a extremely understandable um, point of hesitation for many, many people. Uh, because, as we said earlier, you know, say, "Hey, did you guys do this already, and it didn't go well?" Um, like, 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 shouldn't you know? Why is it right? You know, if if like a you know revolution or revolutions in the past have gone terribly wrong, and as the as Isaac from Portland said. Uh, have ended up creating uh, outcomes, you know, have created regimes, have created kinds of societies very different from uh, what was anticipated by uh, the people originally making the revolution, uh, then, you know, uh, you you kind of owe it to uh, to people now to to have a theory of the case, to have a uh, to have you on on why that happened and, and what lessons could be learned from it and uh, and and why you're sort of un, and like, you know, something kind of something about the game plan, perhaps for uh, for making sure it doesn't happen uh, doesn't happen again. Uh, so I want to I want to open this up to to our panel, and I mean, like, kind of both, you know, because I think there are two sort of dimensions of this that that both deserve some play. One is one is Russia specific, like, because you know if you're like. Really, we're talking about Russia here because uh, most of the, when people say, oh, revolutions, for the most part, later they're talking about revolutions that are made by, you know, capital C communists who already had the Soviet Union as a model and, and sort of saw their goal as replicating that model. Uh, so, so really, we're talking about the Russian revolution. So one is a, a Russia-specific angle, right? It happened there. And then the other one is our... Are there sort of broader lessons here, right? Like if if uh, if some of what happened in Russia was Russia specific, right? Is everything that happened in Russia Russia specific? Are there things that you know are sort of more general problems or issues here? So um, I wonder uh, if we uh, if we want to start uh, at least as the boxes appear on my screen uh, clockwise. Uh, so uh, if we uh, um, want to uh to start uh with uh with dr kuba so i've spent a lot of time thinking about the problem of revolutionary transformation within societies how does it happen what are the conditions that start it what are the determinants of the shape of the outcome and there's um some commonalities about how you get to a revolution. So to a certain extent, like all revolutions do share some basic, uh, basic characteristics. One is that the old system has to break, right? The old dispensation that allowed for the maintenance of, of political authority and a security structure, um, that ends and something uh, that turbulence creates an opportunity for political actors that have been frozen out of the old dispensation 
to uh, enter politics and to assert a radically different uh, vision of how authority should be structured, what the relationship should be between uh, state and its uh, population, um, even a reevaluation of morality. You know, there's something Nietzschean in a genuine revolution where you take the uh, idols and effigies that were held sacred and you um, replace them with uh, new touchstones of value and meaning. And to have a system that's in that desperate a condition usually requires some serious um, crisis, often economic, sometimes economic and military, sometimes just military. Um, but a losing war, war exhaustion, conquest, um, experience of international humiliation, right? Like um, one way that a regime loses legitimacy is it fails to protect you from the outsiders that it's supposed to keep, um, keep out. And um, another is that no matter how much your life sucks, otherwise you should be able to have bread. You should be able to live day by day. If the bread isn't coming and the enemies aren't kept at outside the gates, but are come inside the house, then what point does the, um, what's the point of the old system of authority? So, um, one thing that you have to reckon with is a system that's crashing good, solid conditions, optimal, you know, we've got a budget surplus. We have, um, wonderful outcomes on every single metric. We're at the top of the Fraser Institute's index. You don't have a, re a revolution under those conditions. You're not going to have a Norwegian revolution because the Norwegian system works. You're not going to have an Icelandic revolution because the Icelandic system works. The only times you will get change in countries that are functional are when the functional um, equilibrium is uh, ruined by external events, ex an exogenous shock. And then maybe um, you'll have experimentation with something new, or as in the case of um, Iceland after the 2008 financial crisis, you just have the reestablishment of the old system, just purged of the elements that led to the, uh, to the immediate crisis. So revolutions always take place under very strained and difficult conditions. And to distinguish a revolution versus a restoration, it also has to include outside elements, people who don't have experience running this apparatus. They don't know how to um, manage this society because they've been frozen out of the, uh, the politics. And so the creation of alternative institutions is, um, becomes their means of generating a replacement state. You know, Soviets, instead of the Duma, instead of the Sobor, instead of the um, Tsarist apparatus. However, revolutions also create lots of losers and typically the losers are the people who had the most influence and most access to resources and coercive capacity and international connections um, within the old system so any revolution that fails to account the blowback that it will by its very nature and uh, in gender endangers its uh, own existence uh, a lot of revolutions just get snuffed out um, we're interested in this very strange category of revolutions that succeed, but then don't deliver um, their expectations. One reason for that too is if you're going to have a revolutionary um, call, an appeal for people to cast off the old gods, the old idols, the old allegiances, um, give up on the king, give up on the lords, give up on the priests, give up on God, and instead take your future in your own hands, go out, risk your life, storm the Bastille, storm the Winter Palace, um, stand up to the Cossacks, stand up to the, the Marines, right? Um, put your life on the line in a situation where you know many of you will die. It's just a question of who, just a question of whether you succeed or not. You need some inspiration, something to hope for. And those promises for that new horizon are often simply unattainable, right? The, um, especially in the short to medium term, right? Like 
getting from the October Revolution to luxury automated space communism was always going to be a hundred year process. If you went in believing that this promise was something that could be fulfilled um, immediately or in a short term, or that progress would be um, would be readily traceable, then you're very quickly going to be disappointed. So one reason why we have so many failed leftist revolutions is because the appeal, the, the promise made by leftist revolutions is such a difficult one to fulfill. Uh, and that's not just true of, West, uh, of leftist revolutions. For instance, the Meiji Restoration originally began as a counter shogun revolution of extreme xenophobic nationalist Japanese reaction. And its promise was revere the emperor, expel the barbarian. Instead, the Meiji period is the one where the barbarian is literally invited into the gates and his ways are adapted and forcibly introduced across Japanese society, precisely the opposite of what had been promised. So revolutions in general don't really achieve what the people beginning them are promised. Very seldom. The French Revolution didn't either. Um, the American Revolution, well, look at what, you know, Thomas Paine wasn't particularly satisfied with, um, with the outcome. And so you have um, this additional background characteristic of the type of ideology that can inspire a political revolution it has to be millenary. It has to have something transcendent. Even if the um, ideology that's inspiring the revolution is a deeply materialist one, right? Uh, to believe in communism goes beyond um, and to struggle to give up your life, right, um, for communism means more than um, looking for a better material outcome for yourself and your immediate family. There is a, a metaphysical commitment to it, um, ironic for a movement that tends to disparage metaphysics. Um, but it's difficult to sustain. And um, then there's the whole problem of how do you manage revolutionary violence in ways where violence is necessary to preserve your revolutionary project. You're going to get whites, you're going to get counter-revolutionaries, you're going to get emigres. Every revolution has always, every major revolution, uh, whether conservative or um, leftist, whether uh, liberal or socialist, has always been followed by foreign intervention and war. The American Revolution, the Meiji Restoration, the um, revolutions in China, um, from the Taiping Rebellion to the Boxer Rebellion, to the um, Sun Yat-sen's movement um, and the early Kuomintang to the Chinese revolution, revolutions in all, all across Europe, whether it's Spartacist, the French revolution, always intervention, war, um, and the, the challenge of, of fighting for your survival. And especially when you marry together the um, reality of having an immature political movement that's not familiar with the security apparatus of the state that it inherits um, <clears throat> against much better mobilized and much better resourced enemies looking uh, to its total extinction, then you're going to have conditions for a very inefficient um, security response that will either fail and with it goes the revolution or it will succeed in ways that may be excessively ruthless or um, destructive with severe consequences for its ability to fulfill its political promises just because um, these are people who don't know what they're doing trying to figure out issues of life and death on the fly. Um, there's finally to wrap in the third thing that I mentioned, which is the eschatological millenarian vision of a political revolution. If you have 
that level of commitment, the level of commitment which allows you to die for a cause, then it also blinds you to the suffering that you're inflicting on your enemies. It makes it very easy to kill for the cause um, and not just people who might deserve it for very specific reasons, right? Like the um, Cossack that's leveling his gun um, at your comrades in real time, right? It's him or it's him or your comrades. So, you know, take your pick. But also, what about the Cossack's wife? She's, uh, now that you've killed them, now that you've disposed of them, isn't she an unreliable element, right? All of these potential threats that you're constantly surrounded by, um, the people who refuse to fight, who refuse the appeal of history, of um, the, the urgent moment, it's easy to dismiss um, their suffering as just being necessary for your overall uh, revolutionary goal, thus opening the door for um, you know industrial scale repression. And I've spoken at length, so I'll leave it there. Fair enough. So uh, Dr. Cooper talked a lot about um, revolution in general, and and that we can include national revolutions, proletarian revolutions, communist revolutions, etc. And all those in my categorizations are slightly different things. Um, one thing we can say in specific to the Russian case is that it was developmentally limited. It was predicated on joining up with socialist revolutions, which failed in other areas, which would have made its uh, developmental limitations less of a problem. Um, its attempt to establish uh, national autonomy with, with areas that were formerly parts of the Russian Empire actually complicated things immediately and caused what national autonomy meant to be consistently redefined even before Stalin. Um, as soon as you have the, 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 Georgian, uh, the Georgian affair in, in 1922 in the context of the Russian Civil War, you are already getting into limiting the power of independent um, socialist polities of which you have yourself said that they were independent and and sovietized enough to be participating in the grand union um those are specific to to uh to the ussr um the treaty of brest luvix which i butcher sorry i can't pronounce anything polish or russian um it also is a major limitation because it it kind of put you in an, a, a situation of uh, a claim to need to expand, but then an unwillingness to do so, um, which is going to drain your internal resources. Um, another thing that we have to look at in the case of the Russian Revolution that is different from prior bourgeois revolutions and um, national liberation revolutions in specific is that there's an international promise and an existing socialist apparatus which the which the 21 points that they release actually forces the entire socialist movement all over the world to split upon um this limits your allies all right um now some of those things in the 21 points that kind of split the socialist internationals from the communist internationals caused the second international to more or less collapse for a little while and then re get reconstituted a couple of times um are things that i think would be worth fighting for others are absolutely not um for example just to put it in perspective the socialist party of america was one of the few socialist parties that voted in line with what the bolsheviks would have wanted um for all of its flaws and in, in internal racist debates, et cetera, that that was definitely the case. But Eugene Debs could not sign on to the 21 points, all right? Which means that you are immediately in the case of uh, the, the communist re revolution, you are immediately dividing the socialist world in such a way that you are limiting allies of other groups that shared your goals and ideologies. That's a problem. Another problem yeah. that I, yeah. I did just I just want to uh, want to say I mean like 
uh, that after you know World War One, when the uh, the Socialist International, you know, the Second International got back together, I mean, they did send an invite to the Bolsheviks to uh, to to participate in the you know new uh, international conference, and they said, "No, screw you, you guys are traitors," you know, which. Um, there's some understandable backstory there in terms of the attitude of most of those parties initially towards World War One, but you know there might be a case to be made that, that was ultimately a mistake. Yeah, I mean it leads to third periodism, third periodism, which while that actually ends up being kind of a good thing in the U.S., it's a disaster in Europe. But nonetheless, let's focus back on the revolution here. You also have a civil war now. I'm just going to point out that I can't think of a revolution that is not either a civil war or immediately results in a civil war. In the case of the Bolshevik Revolution and the October Revolution, um, there is a war that leads to the February Revolution. The October Revolution is not really a war. Um, whether or not you think it's a coup is a matter of uh, debate and perspective, even among socialists. Uh, but it's 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 not bloodless i'm not gonna but it also was not nearly as bloody as any other element of the event including the civil war which came after which was the bloodiest part of the whole affair that is similar to the united states where our civil war is actually the bloodiest part and i consider it part of our long revolution um so it's it's something to consider you're going to have to deal with that and that introduces almost conditions of maximum entropy into a society the kinds of things that Dr. Cooper is talking about, reprisals, where you cut off reprisals, et cetera, uh, immediately spread throughout society. And all kinds of other pent-up things, a lot of which have nothing to do with socialism or capitalism at all, are released. I mean, you look at what happens in the Great Proletarian Social Revolution. Um, I am a kind of a defender. It's one of the few things about, you know, about Maoism I'll defend. Cultural revolution, but, yeah, the Cultural Revolution, the Great yeah. Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that it does is it unleashes all these all this ethnic conflict in, in parts of China. All right. Um, there's like Toysinese reply uh, um, reprisals on Han and vice versa. Um, there's a lot of Han revanchism on the Manchus, etc. This is this is something that nobody in this system wants. But the violence of these events unleashes it. Now, the, the, I'm also going to say something somewhat controversial. G given the, the violence of, of uh, Chinese revolutions, and I'm not just talking about the one, also going back into, all the way back to the, quote, Boxer Rebellion, which had eight times more people die in it than the U.S. Civil War. I just want people to, like, let that simmer in their brain. Um, the 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 Cultural Revolution was relatively not bloody. A lot of people died. Um, but when you look at the deaths in, say, the 30s or the deaths in the 1890s, um, it's not as many as one would. Or would. even in the Taiping Rebellion. Yes. Yeah. Like tens of millions. Right. Which is not to say that that's, that, that that's justified, but you do have to look at this on scale. Um, but there's, there's also... I, I mean, I think the great distinguishing feature of the Cultural Revolution, as opposed to Taiping, as opposed to the Boxer Rebellion, as opposed to the 1930s, the century of humiliation, warlordism, you name it, Japanese invasion, is that it was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. That was a revolution of choice. The PRC was already entrenched. You didn't have to do it. But they did, which is a challenge. It's unnecessary from the standpoint of stability. It is not unnecessary from the standpoint of what they said they were aiming to do. The question that you have to answer in all these cases is how do you incorporate these former elements of the prior society into your society and can you let them remain what they were? Well, um, there's also, but that presupposes that you've even produced that new society which I think is much more of a question and much more of a challenge um, that post-revolutionary uh, generation translating the revolution made of people who were products of the pre-revolutionary society into a, a system that can raise children, that can educate a new generation, that can pass on um, what the revolution is supposed to be, that can sort of pass the torch on 
what's a generational pro many generation project that's a very tall order and um one of the places where a revolution can go very wrong i'm not disagreeing with you that the that the cultural revolution was both poorly handled and and very destabilizing however it is also the only time in which many communist promises were actually done and in which de democratization of things like education and healthcare were attempted in China. They are rolled back afterwards, but we're not, we're not really talking about that right now. I mean, one of the things that I'm pointing out here is that the cultural revolution is an attempt to actually deliver on that new society and generation now. Um, and uh, that's actually one, um, one major issue with leftist revolution specifically. Right. The oh. part of the appeal of a revolution for individuals exhausted by the failure of the old system is the promise that you can return to something like normalcy, right? That's the whole Biden appeal, in fact. Um, the but normalcy is not going to be luxury automated femboy communism um and if we need to get to luxury automated femboy communism which let's face it what's the point of mankind um except Obviously, to achieve that yeah. then um yeah like maybe we have to do more but that does mean um well kind of betraying the people who just want to get back to normal yeah. so some so the, form of new normalcy so the uh the point that i i should say in the discussion the original discussion on tir that um that gene made there which i mean i think has been kind of glancingly referred to here but you know maybe just you know deserves to be highlighted a little bit more is that you know surely if the question is okay um you know if the broader question you know, is how revolutions go wrong, and the more specific question is how the Russian Revolution go wrong, then surely part of the answer to that is that um, nobody, certainly not uh, the original leaders of the Russian Revolution, because they were way too orthodox Marx to believe this, thought that you could uh, skip straight from a uh, semi-feudal, mostly agrarian, like mostly pre-capitalist society with some islands of capitalism in the city in uh, the cities uh, like Moscow and Petrograd, that you could skip from that to the fully, uh, you know, fully automated luxury space gay communism, uh, you know, without having some sort of industrial base from somewhere, which uh, they thought would be supplied by by the West. That this is, um, I mean, you know, like there are, uh, I, as Kuba pointed out, he actually did a video about this uh, for uh, for TIR. Uh, the father of Russian Marxism, Grigory Plekhanov, uh, you know, was thought, hey, historical materialism, uh, you, you can't, uh, what, uh, what kind of form of social organization you even can have is downstream of the development of the forces of production. Uh, what are you talking about? You could have socialism in, uh, in, in like czarist Russia. Uh, you know, they need, you need to have a, a liberal a liberal democratic bourgeois revolution first and you know and, and then like a while later you could have your workers revolution i mean but there's also evidence that pokanoff actually had marx impressed so that so that he could maintain that um late marx yeah. in particular uh yeah, one of the yeah so 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 i actually let me just sorry uh before you go back to your point i, I just wanted to say on that point right so so Plekhanov is the sort of uh ultra orthodox marxist he's actually mm -hmm like more more catholic than the pope on this uh because marx was willing to be a little bit uh flexible about this so most famously so marx wrote this uh letter to responding to a query from the russian marxist Ferris Asulich, and then in 1881 uh and then which is like the way he puts it in the letter is a little bit ambiguous but then i think there's a much more clear formulation the next year in 1882 there's the second, uh, the introduction to the second Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto, where he says, okay, uh, maybe you can skip past capitalism in Russia, but only if revolution in Russia becomes a signal for uh, proletarian revolution in the West. 
uh, and that position, the not more Catholic than the Pope, but exactly as Catholic as the Pope uh, position was the one that Lenin and Trotsky explicitly had when they were uh, starting the Russian Revolution. I mean, they, they didn't, you know, they didn't think no. that you could go straight to uh, to socialism <coughs> on the basis of the industrial infrastructure of czarist Russia. They thought well, I think, you need to borrow somebody think, else's industrial infrastructure to make that happen. And, I think that's, that's, I think that's a critical point that people need to understand when they're assessing the Russian Revolution. I mean, you know, the whole road to socialism is paved with nothing but defeats as uh comrade rosa says so we got to learn from those uh defeats uh and you know the the fact is and i think this is missed out on uh a lot today by people on the left because uh orthodox marxist leninism has become a third world de- developmentalist program and a successful one like uh, uh, you know that my strongest defense of china is is basically the social democratic reformist defense which is like they lifted a hell of a lot of people out of poverty a lot quicker than India. Can't argue with those numbers. Yes, there's problematic things about China, but there are problematic things about everybody. Let's, right. uh, not, got, let's not get on our high horse too much about everything. But, you know, you're pointing it out there that Lenin viewed himself as part of an international movement. Uh, and these people took internationalism seriously, organizing internationally, strategizing internationally. Today, we have a pale imitation of that, which is this multipolarity where people fantasize about geopolitics, about things they don't affect. Whereas Lenin and Trotsky were operating in a period where you had a vibrant socialist movement that was trying to work tactically to take power in different countries. And the Russian Revolution, I mean, they called it the October Revolution, not the Russian Revolution, because it was supposed to be that signal. And its isolation was its uh, uh, eventual, you know, its eventual defeat. It's its transformation from being a potential spark for an international revolution into basically just a national revolution that ended up liquidating feudalism quicker than than the Tsar could have done. Yeah, I I think this is actually important to build off of, though, because we can actually do some positive principles from this, because this is both something that is very real for the Soviets. It's very rare for the first for the first, second and third international. So that's until 1936. The common turn. We have a an, uh, an international movement. The problem that happens in regards to the Russian Revolution, though, because the Russian Revolution is successful but besieged, all right, um, it asked, because it's the first successful revolution, other revolutions to put, uh, other revolutionaries to put their own movements on standstill for for the sake of succeeding in Russia. That is a primary agenda of the common turn starting at, starting actually even before Stalin. Mm-hmm. It starts once you start dealing with the civil wars. Um, we've already talked about the 21 points, which means that the socialist internationals and the communist internationals can't play along, and they never do. Um, uh, it, this also leads to a whole lot of socialists becoming diehard anti-communists, both in the Russian context uh, we can talk about all the SRs that went to America that end up working for the Hoover Institution. Um, and in the uh, European context, you know, this is a space where fascists are, ever play, are able to play socialist and communist off each other, particularly in Germany, um, until the, they're both weak and they can kill them both. Um, and that's literally what happened. That's not a metaphor. So, you know, the that's one thing. Another thing I think this leads us to, and this is something internal to the Bolsheviks and internal to the Soviets, and we'll use the Soviets and not the Russian case, because we're right, we should not actually do the whole anti-communist thing and pretend this is just a Russian issue, um, is that the faction banning and the banning and centralization of not ju- not just getting rid of like reactionary bourgeois parties, okay, I think you will have to suppress some of them. Sorry, people who don't think you can you can suppress anyone. You have to suppress Nazis and probably capitalists too. But the suppression of socialist groups related to you, all right, comes up a lot. And I don't just doesn't just come up in the context of the Russian Revolution. It also comes in context in the Mexican Revolution, where eventually you have stuff like the the League of Trade Union and the Magonist killing Zapatistas for the liberal state. 
All right, that really happened. Um, and ironically, the Zapatistas got their land reform, and the Magonis just got fucked. But so, so, so I, I do want to hone in on on some of the point that that Vard is raising because this is actually, I will say, from my perspective, the the biggest thing that I thought was missing from the first discussion. Uh, because I think that like what Gene was talking about, uh, in you know, I think is really you know is really important, and I think that's the sort of crucial soviet specific uh dimension of the the problem that the you're talking about an underdeveloped country that's besieged and not its own and so you know more more catholic than the plekhanov's prediction that you'd have incan industrialization uh turned out to be uh exactly right that you know that you you'd have to um uh if you're like you know if you need to um you know, socialism is not supposed to be a developmental <laughs> program, right? That's what capitalism is for. Uh, socialism is supposed to be about taking the machine that's built up by capitalism and you know, and, and uh, socializing it. Uh, and I, but I think you, I think you, you've hit your the nail on the head, right? Um, capitalism, uh, socialism, especially if we're reconfiguring the geography to emphasize more on the global south and the, um, you know, what was called the third world has to have a developmentalist answer and program or else it will run into um, the exact same problems uh, you know it will continue to grind against the material question yeah so but this this is why by the way um you know this is one of the reasons that i'm uh i think it's it's not a secret that you know that that as once as a young and you know a foolish young man you know as a trotskyist and one of the reasons that i'm uh even to, you know Besides the fact that I don't really think that word means anything, if you live in America in 2023, one of the reasons I no longer am, even when thinking back to Russia in the 1920s, is that I think that the program of Trotsky's left opposition was incoherent, that they uh, they wanted to have restored workers' democracy and also have rapid-fire industrialization and collectivization. I don't think you could do both. I think that the um, I think that if you have if you're basically trying to replicate what took centuries of bloodshed to do in England, uh, you know, to, to sort of turn peasants into, uh, into factory workers, um, and to have, you know, and to, to rapidly build up this industrial machine, it's going to be very difficult to do that in a cozy and consensual way. So that, that's, that's the issue that I think that, uh, Gene was very rightly highlighting the TIR discussion, but, the point that I think Vard was just getting to, that in the last few minutes are together, I really want to throw to the, the panel in a sort of more explicit way, is just like, okay, look, cards on the table. I mean, part of my takeaway from, from the Russian case is, you know, I guess what if you don't like it, you could call a liberal proceduralist takeaway, which is that you can't, like, I, I don't think you could have a complete account of what went wrong here without using phrases like, you know, civil liberties and, uh, you know, multi-party democracy and stuff like that. I think that those things are actually, as it turns out, really important. And uh, and, I, and the idea that you're going to have a, a state that's actually a worker state that actually has some kind of mass working class participation in the political process uh, at the same time as people who are accused of counter-revolutionaries are, you know, get a midnight knock is doesn't really make a lot of uh, a lot of sense that I that I think that you and you know you do need you know like like I'm, I'm I don't buy at all the idea that it's like oh well different political parties just represent different social classes so you wouldn't need parties you know in a uh, classless society or anything like that I think I think that you need to have those mechanisms in place if you actually want what you end up with to be an expansion of democracy from what you get in capitalist democracy rather than, rather than a, a, a contraction of it. Like I, I, I have to, and again, I'll, I'm just sort of wearing my, you know, petty bourgeois little proceduralism on my sleeve here. And I'll let you guys react to this however you want to that, you know, like one of the takeaways here has got to be, if somebody tells you that um, we're going to have uh, a temporary emergency um, dictatorship, but don't worry you know, we'll, we'll have a full flower in socialist democracy at some point in the well, future. Vi violence, you know, temporary the has a way of becoming forever. The problem is violence is an inherently conservatizing force it, with a small, with a small C, right? You know, people after living in like, uh, as Cooper was saying, after living in traumatic situations, they just want to go back to normal. And there's a kind of conservatizing 
uh, tendency in that. I think that's what Stalinism represented to a certain degree. And, you know, Stalinism saw the reversal of a lot of the social liberalism of the early Bolshevik period. And of course, the war situation in the early Bolshevik period, uh, of course, uh, led to the suppression of alternative voices within uh, the communist movement, because of course, there's this ever dangerous tendency of once you start draw and and you know this is a line you have to draw, as Vaughn says, right? There are forces that let's say you had a revolution that you couldn't allow to operate freely in, in the country because they would do uh, like a terrorism or things like that. But once you draw that line, suddenly there's there is there is an instinct and an and, and tendency to draw that line ever shorter and shorter, excluding ever more people from that line until you end up with just a very narrow circle of people who are, because they've drawn that line so small around themselves, uh, deeply paranoid about like their position. I mean, like, the, yeah. So so I think that there's, there's a danger, like war has all these, has this conservatizing effect on people. Uh, it kills some of the most dedicated cadre and then you end up with a kind of exhausted population. So, uh, and of course, because these socialist revolutions, and not just socialists, go back to 19, uh, 1906 back in to Iran, Rome. 1908 in the Ottoman Empire, 1911 in China, Portugal, uh, you know, Mexico, you know, these revolutions, came, these liberal revolutions came to power with, you know, big uh, uh, dreams and ideals, but degenerated very quickly into you know, um, into kind of like a, 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 a narrow elite. Once re-automated cat boy communism. Yeah, or not even in the case of the liberal revolutions of the early 20th century, you know, the Ottoman, Persian, Chinese co constitutional revolutions, they were in part smashed by imperialism uh, to a greater or lesser degree, but were also victims of the, the revolutionary cadre who made those revolutions uh, either completely falling out with each other or just p having successive purges. And it's not like a purely, you know, if you if people want to make this like, oh, it's a communist problem. This is a problem that uh, happened for the revolutionaries in in, in the Ottoman Empire, in, in Republican China, in Portugal, in the 19th century, like liberals, right? Liberal revolutions has happened in. You know, this is a general pro uh, problem of these kind of modern style of political revolutions, whether they're proletarian revolutions, socialist revolutions, or liberal revolutions, uh, you know, that, that there is this, you know, like there is this tendency for them to degenerate into a kind of, or uh, some form of either dictatorship, like narrow dictatorship uh, of a kind of elite, or maybe of a, you have a personalized regime, or maybe you have a small uh, party elite or what have you, but it, they, they end with the suppression of civil society. Which I would note that for Marx, if we go back to the the master, I mean that's where he saw socialism emanating from, not so much from from a top down elite, but from organs built in civil society, and that was the model of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, uh, which was the gold standard until until the, it failed. Until it failed. Yeah. Although, but, although uh, even 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 Lenin, uh, after the Russian Revolution, after World War One, after the Russian Revolution, in a pamphlet with the unsubtle title "The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky," uh, even in there he says, "Yeah, before, you know, before World War One, this is about as close as we had anywhere in the world to what a workers' party should be." Just uh, I have one very quick observation to make, which is um, the. When it comes to multi-party electoralism or civil liberties, the whole game is creating the apparatus of coercion, law enforcement, legality, judicial oversight that can make those um, rights enforceable in society. That can push back not just against, um, let's say, popular excesses, because often the people you know, are very zealous in persecuting perceived enemies of the people. But they say the purge um, is not just Stalin. It's also like the Soviet people getting revenge on people who piss them off. I mean, like, I mean, um, that's what happened in the Cultural Revolution. But, you, yeah. you take the lid off. Yeah, but also, also what happens to the Salem trials, right? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And, and that's and this is why um, 
there is something there is something to the liberal preoccupation with uh, the rule of law and the elevation of the legal profession into something like uh, a monkhood, a priesthood, because there is a great deal that depends on preserving um, a judicial system that ultimately is not reducible to individual or class interests. Um, and yeah. it's uh, something that is extraordinarily challenging to do. There's no, no easy way to, to get to that outcome. Um, and that's because of its association with liberal bourgeois politics, it's also a, a place where leftists think that you can be more based by throwing those considerations out the window, shooting all the lawyers. Right. So there's two there's two tendencies that I think that we can elevate uh, here. One, don't ban factions both within the party and and in general society at large, and in the international, like that's like that's also got to be dealt with. Like this is not in the case of leftist revolutions, you're not dealing just dealing with a national polity. I think two, um, I've always taken the dictatorship of the proletariat to mean this, but I know that that's like a Draperite position, and people can get mad at me about it, but. Uh, I think what that is, is establishing law and systems that are based in proletarian, i.e. workers uh, associations, and that that means you need law, et cetera. The suspension of law for, say, the bourgeoisie is not so we can murder them all after the revolution, uh, because if we've done our job right, they aren't bourgeoisie anymore because that function is gone. Um, it might take a while to do that. I mean, if we if we take about like the, the bourgeois revolutions, how long it took for them to get rid of the aristocracy, and in some places still they haven't done it. You know, the first liberal revolutions in England, they still have their aristocracy to this day. Uh, Spain still does, etc. But um, you... you it was not a quick process, even in the cases of developed so, uh, socialist society. And I think we do have to realize that. But what we can't do, I think, for example, and we talked about this uh, in uh, an episode that hasn't come out yet, but when me and Kuba talked about class society and, and non-capitalist stuff, when stuff that Marx doesn't talk about. But for example, if terror is your only means of controlling the center of society, the, the nomenclatura, the, the bureaucrats, et cetera, um, that's not a sustainable society. Mm -hmm. You can't terrorize your administrators forever. No society has ever done it and survived. Um, and what you have to do is somehow have those <coughs> administrators be of the politics and the class that instantiates that. And that's got to be through basically what we might call proletarian law, right? Um, but that does mean that we have to recognize political divisions within workers because they're real. They're not all just going to be like, even if they're all socialist and communist, which they're not, but even if they were, what that means for them is going to be divisive and antagonistic. The idea that after the revolution, social antagonism goes away because we got rid of the main class conflict, I think is not just naive. It's just flat wrong. Yeah. But there's, there's something kind of, I mean, it... I, yeah, I mean it's very naive. I mean because it it should shouldn't take you very long to think of a lot of sources of social antagonism besides class antagonism. But it's like oh, there's, there's something that's like honestly, and I know there's a strand of classical Marxism and frankly even things in Marx that you know like point that direction. But it's like it's uh, you know this whole idea that it's like oh you're just gonna have this kind of neutral administration administration of things rather than you know rather than like something where people are really con contested for uh, for power in a political way uh like like i think it's there's something that's like almost um you know anti-human about it because because you like um what like people in you know take away class conflict and people are just like monoliths who don't you know who don't like uh you know you don't yeah, that... have there are lots of issues we could still murder each other over. Yeah, We're, people are very creative. They'll come up with new stuff. Yo!
have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>